Major Mike Wazinski from the 6th Air Refueling Squadron over at Travis Air Force Base, California. Uh, I'm a KC-10 instructor pilot, and my role is just to teach the next generation of KC-10 aircrew uh, to conduct safe operations all around the world. Our primary mission is obviously air-to-air -air refueling. Uh, it's, it's our bread and butter. It's what we love doing most. And then our secondary role is obviously cargo and passengers. Uh, you can see behind us today, we do have the uh, seat pallets on board. Uh, so the KC-10 can hold 75 troops, uh, as well as up to 27 pallets of cargo. So that's a little bit more cargo than the C-17 uh, pallet-wise, but they've obviously got us beat on the height. Unrefueled, uh, we can go about 18 to 20 hours if we're just burning all 340,000 pounds of our own fuel. And that just enables us to go anywhere, any place, at any given time. So uh, when we found out that uh, Avalon was going ahead, we put the gears in motion to really represent the KC-10 and the United States uh, down here in Australia. We, we understand that this is our biggest partnership is with the Australians, as well as this is the largest air show and trade show in the Southern Hemisphere. So we put all of our resources together and we fought to get uh, this KC-10 down here. We left Travis a few days ago. Uh, so Travis in California, and we flew direct approximately 14 hours to Kadena Air Base, Okinawa in Japan and once there we offloaded the cargo that was bound for Japan and we uploaded a little bit of uh, maintenance cargo for the F-15 and F-22 demo teams that are here at Avalon today. Once we were there we briefed with the KC-135 based out of Kadena as well as the uh, Iowa Air National Guard and we brought as a 10-ship formation the beautiful F-22s and F-15s that are also on the ramp and gracing the skies here uh, today. It took uh, six air refuelings and it was just a it's, a great operation just to watch all 10 airplanes sync together, meet up on time and make it in one hop from Okinawa to here to beautiful Avalon. My first time ever in Australia was uh, back in 2018 when my wife's grandfather turned 90. And so it was actually here in Melbourne. We flew in from uh, New York uh, straight over. Uh, and it was incredible and I, I just fell in love with the country there and then. Uh, just the culture, the way of life, the friendliness and obviously the beautiful weather. And uh, When I was flying alongside in the KC-10 uh, in New Jersey with an Australian, that kind of just put everything together. He was in the right seat, I was in the left seat and I said, hey, something is this something that's reciprocal in Australia? Uh, so Squiz said, absolutely, yes it is. And I just started doing a little bit of research about the military personnel exchange program. It's a, obviously a one-for-one -one swap between our two uh, countries, and it's just to build that interoperability, build that knowledge base, and if anything else, build the mateship that has obviously been extremely strong since uh, 1918. So it was great. So I got awarded the assignment uh, over the moon. Uh, we came here in June of 2019 to Brisbane, flew in, and for the last three years, it was just the best time of our lives. I'm married to two small children at the time, and we uh, since had another child in Brisbane uh, there. So uh, we grew our family, but not only did that happen, we just grew professionally as well. The KC-30, incredible airplane, incredible capability, and the way the RAF flies it, the way the RAF has developed it and employed it, I'm in awe. It, it still is just so impressive. Even though I've been a part of the squadron now, and now since I've been you know, approximately six months removed from the squadron, it still holds a very dear spot in my heart. Uh, and I think the efforts of having the Australians in the United States and the Americans here in Australia, it just makes us work together. Um, you, you'll see it throughout the Pacific, the Australian KC-30 refueling PACF F-22s. You'll see us obviously coming down here and having uh, a very large presence here in the Southern Hemisphere. And it just shows how entwined and how interlaced we really, really are as uh, two great countries. Well, the big thing when I, when I first got to the simulators there at Amberley, uh, was just, the, it's an incredible, beautiful operation that they've got going and it's a very well-oiled machine. Prior to getting to Australia, having six years of experience on the KC-10, it took a lot for me to beat that McDonnell Douglas Boeing knowledge out of my mind where it's very mechanical, very action do where the Airbus is very ergonomic, you have your SOPs, you have your flows, and it's just a lot, uh, a lot cleaner and a lot smoother in that sense. Still, two very capable airplanes, but 
at the end of the day, two very different airplanes. You know, the Australian KC-30 has 270 seats and they use it like it's advertised. It is an absolute multi-role tanker transport. It is an incredible force enabler here in the South Pacific and across the globe. The KC-10, you know, we, we use the mass in numbers, but we just do our troop and passenger movements a little bit different compared to the Australians. And so for me, uh, seeing the logistics side of that and seeing the whole Airbus, Northrop Grumman, and obviously 33 Enterprise come together uh, domestically and then go to places like Guam or go to Hickam uh, and really operate with the Americans has just been noteworthy and, and I've taken a few things back with me to the States, mainly the food. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was one of the great things obviously. With the 270 seats you have extremely professional crew attendants that take care of everything from the flight deck door back. It, and it's incredible. They, they're definitely the face of the Australian Air Force, face of this beautiful Australian country. Um, and for me, it's just about customer service now. So whether you're a boom operator offloading gas behind the KC-10 to your customer, the F-22, the F-15, or whether you're a flight engineer or a pilot, it just it, it's allowed us to bring customer service to that higher notch. And I think uh, it, it's, it's going to help us going into the future. KC-10, you know, it's been in service since the early 80s with the United States Air Force. We had 60 uh, any given time. Uh, and again, it, this was, they saw a great opportunity and great capability with the KC-135, but they just needed a little bit more bigger operations to get, get going here. So, like we said, you know, that 340,000 pounds of fuel is, is, is massive, right? Uh, you know, that's about two KC-135s load of fuel. Um, this specific model behind me is a 1983 model, so it, it has a birthday this year, you know, it's turning uh, 40. It was delivered in uh, early December of 1983, and this one actually came down to Avalon in 2011. So, again, KC-10 has an immense pride here in the Pacific, just, you know, the largest ocean in the world, and it allows us to refuel all sorts of fighters, not just boom fighters or boom receivers. We can do the Hornets uh, and, and anyone else that needs gas to get across these long distances. Uh, not this specific model, uh, but we do have approximately 20 to 30 KC-10s that allow us to have the wingtip pods like the KC-30. And that was a requirement brought over uh, by the U.S. Navy. Uh, when we did you know, do these Pacific transverses, they just needed us to have more tap time with the drogue. So the KC-10 engineers, again, it's such a big airplane that it was so easy just to modify this airplane to have those wingtip pods or warps uh, put onto this jet. So again, very capable airplane. It is sad to see them go. You know, they are 40 years old. Um, but we're really excited for the KC-46 as well. It's, it's going to be a great capability. It has different sorts of capability, obviously not the volume of fuel uh, that the KC-10 can offload, um, but we're excited going into the future, even though it will be bittersweet next year when the last one does head to uh, the Boneyard in Arizona.